Uh, so I, I'm not uh, MC here for this session, but uh, maybe at the very beginning, we would like to ask everyone to give a self-introduction for maybe three minutes each. So let me begin. My presentation, I am Masataka uh, Hosawo. Our company produces uh, Nishijin textiles. About uh, 1,200 uh, years ago, we have started this uh, weaving industry. So uh, in 1688, our company was founded, and I am assuming that 12th, uh, the uh, president appointed uh, for this uh, company. Please take a look at uh, this art, Tokugawa Imperial uh, Palace. Um, you can see the uh, arts have been pursued uh, in the Nishijin industry here in Kyoto. And what is unique uh, is that to forget about um, the economy, they are always pursuing the perfect uh, form of art all the time. Another feature uh, of Nishijin textiles, we have a segmented uh, works. So within the area, uh, maybe five kilometers uh, in radius, Various uh, uh, special technology, the experts were uh, residing in that area and working together to form this uh, Nishijin textile. And uh, kimono, as well as uh, the pottery industries, the market is uh, downsizing. And actually, 90% of the uh, market were lost uh, when you are to compare uh, the peak uh, the market. Please take a look at the OB. Uh, the width uh, of uh, Obi is uh, 32 centimeters. And uh, this is a tie for a kimono. And uh, our company, uh, in 2010, uh, we produced uh, uh, the Nishijin textile Obi uh, utilizing 150 weaving machines. Weaving machines are being used and then having this uh, wider uh, the uh, width uh, of uh, Obi, and this is our headquarter building. And in this uh, building, we have uh, various uh, research activities and presentation of our product. And then uh, three computer programmers and then several mathematicians got together and they come up with this uh, uh, new type of uh, weaving uh, product uh, utilizing state of art technology. And this is uh, the exhibition in Kyosela Art Museum. And then also been working together with the Zozo uh, town, uh, research people and the University of Tokyo. So we have uh, this uh, a new approach of changing the design uh, along with the change of the temperatures, for example. And then also in this exhibition, we have uh, the weaved tea room and Izumi-san uh, is also helping us. And we have this uh, mobile type of uh, tea rooms, and it is covered by textiles. And then within a matter of a day, you'll be um, able to demolish and reconstruct the building. So today, if you have a time, would you please uh, uh, visit us, our booth, uh, showing this uh, textile made a tea room. That's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Next. Uh, Izumi from Tea Tradition. And so I am in the tea ceremony activities always. And then there is a Chado Research Center. And I am the uh, vice, uh, the director, uh, director of a Chado Research Center. And uh, we have um, the school specified for a Chado or tea ceremony. And that's uh, only a unique uh, such a school in Japan. I've been also teaching there as well. And this uh, uh, is a Kabuto gate, Kabuto Mon gate. And so when it comes to um, tea ceremony, uh, we call this chado or chanoyu. Or we often use uh, the term knowledge such as the way of the tea. <coughs> so uh, this world of the tea ceremony or the world, uh, actually, uh, this uh, the way of the tea presents the way of living, serving the tea to others through that activities, 
uh, you can have a connection, you know, there is a connection between the guest and the host. So what we do in this process of the way of tea, basically not only just serving the tea, but we provide the meals uh, as well as the drinks and then there's uh, some desserts. And at the end of the process, you provide the tea. Uh, this uh, is a full process of chaji. And, uh, and so if you were to uh, downsize and uh, summarize them, uh, we have uh, this uh, tea ceremony activity. And then through this uh, process, again, the guest and uh, uh, the host can enjoy all the um, appliances uh, being utilized or devices <coughs> being utilized in a tea ceremony. Uh, back in 2003, my uh, father passed away. Uh, my uh, father uh, is named uh, the uh, brother uh, of uh, the master uh, of uh, uh, the Chado Urasenke. Uh, and uh, uh, so what uh, uh, should be uh, the way of tea uh, f from now into the future? And my father uh, was uh, the brother uh, of uh, the uh, master, uh, and uh, he actually uh, thought that this was a mission to transcend this uh, tradition uh, to uh, the rest of the world. And he felt as if that he was at the uh, border uh, of the mastery uh, the piece of the tea ceremony and the rest of the world. And, and so uh, with that in mind, he created uh, uh, Chabie. And so starting from 1988, uh, this activity uh, started. Uh, craft uh, theatrical activities on the left-hand side, you see my father. And uh, so the craft uh, artist come up with their uh, work piece and then provide the work piece to the guests and then they uh, can uh, be part of this entire, uh, you know, to ceremony, uh, chakai. Uh, so when you feel a tea ceremony, you might uh, have this state, uh, uh, stereotyped way of thinking this is something formal, but it is not the case. Usually it was very informal, intricate, uh, uh, the relationship exchange of the people were in presence. And uh, actually from that, uh, the grassroots activity, so to speak, now explored into something very professional. And now in this uh, glass-made uh, tea uh, room, uh, this uh, Sai, uh, Zaigen uh, designed uh, the room, and uh, this uh, other man wearing uh, some fashion designers, uh, the attire, to do the tea ceremony. So uh, you can uh, see this was uh, some initiatives taking place with that the new way of uh, the mind set I did not understand this concept fully because I was very young uh, the, but uh, when I uh, saw the archive uh, book uh, it was so stimulating it was so interesting it was so cool so I thought of why not uh, uh, have this movement uh, uh, based upon this theme uh, be transcended or maybe transmitted to the new generation. So I am uh, exploring this Sabi A, uh, the meeting of the beauty of the tea or art, uh, is something that I was uh, or I have been exploring in my life. Thank you very much. Konnichiwa. Uh, my name is Theaster. Uh, I'm an American artist um, based in Chicago. And uh, my practice probably has a lot also to do with uh, the importance of history and uh, my, my personal culture. Uh, my dad was a, a builder, a laborer. And uh, when I was a young man, he was a roofer. Um, he taught me the tradition of roofing, and it was the way we made money, so I got school money because I helped him on the weekends and after school. Uh, as he got older and was preparing to retire, I decided that I would, uh, in honor of him, uh, try to incorporate roofing into my uh, artistic practice. And, um, and so now I make paintings that are based on his labor practices. Uh, before I got to roofing, though, um, my training had been in uh, ceramics. Uh, I studied ceramics uh, 
in Ames, Iowa, in Iowa. And um, after about six years of, of training with my instructor, she um, suggested that uh, I should go to Tokonami, Japan. So she wrote a letter to a gentleman named uh, Mr. Ichihara. And uh, I realized that I was then the third generation of uh, people, my, my instructor and her instructor from the middle 80s who had been going to, to Tokoname. And um, as a result of this encounter in Tokoname, uh, my artistic life and practice changed. Um, I became deeply involved in the kind of uh, cultural activity of Tokoname, but, but more when I would leave Tokoname, uh, Shintoism, Buddhism, Tokonami Yaki, those things were on my mind and they were affecting my aesthetic decisions so that in some ways I, f I feel like I'm a part conceptual artist, part Japanese potter. Uh, over the years of, of spending time in Tokonami, uh, I've gotten older. I was 20, 28, 29 when I went. I'm 50 now, but the, the men and women who trained me are also getting older. Uh, Mr. Hirano-san is uh, 86, and uh, as, as they get older, they're starting to ask questions about how will the traditions continue, and uh, I'm also asking this question, how will the traditions in Tokonami continue? So I'm, in a way, learning, uh, I'm learning how to be a better artist by spending time with great artists, and they include um, artist in Tokoname. So I, I think that my contribution to this conversation is the kind of mashup between um, the culture that I knew when I was a young man with my dad and the culture that I've learned over time from spending time in this small town. Thanks very much. Thank you. So now allow me to give a presentation. I'm Kataoka from Mori Art Museum in Tokyo and also National Art Research Center. I'm also serving as the director. I'm specialized in the contemporary art. So in that sense, I'm typically not so much on the tradition, but some new values presented to what's existing. But there is a history behind that, and there is a history behind contemporary art. But typically, when you think about the white cube within the museum, and that's where we exhibit. But when you go to a rural area, like an art festival or triennale type of events, we use uh, non-typical venues, not museums. So sometimes, uh, well, oftentimes, you know, artists need to respond to what's unique in the area or the history. And then this is an international art festival in Aichi Prefecture last year in Ichinomiya venue. And this Ichinomiya is known for uh, weaving. And they have a uh, Simikaekan used to be a headquarter of a company, and this is the work of uh, Leonor Antunes. And this is the only building uh, uh, designed by Tange, Tange Keiji and Tange, and then this is the, her response to it. And she studied in, she's been doing research on Michiko Yamawaki, who studied in Bell House, and this is the, one of the work that's related to that. And Shio Tachiharu, maybe you know her very well. Uh, Shio Tachiharu is known for uh, installation using this red uh, yarn thread. And she's using a uh, formal factory, and there were loom in the machine as well. So this is a little bit different way of presenting work rather than like a typical white cubes. And this is the Tokoname venue. Maruri Tokan, this uh, former Maruri Tokan building. And then we have the work from Mr. Thiersta Gates, and then we had listening house. Old house converted into a place to have a collection of records and neon signs created new, work, uh, new works to respond to what's, pre uh, what's there. And on top, 
Uh, we have we actually this is in the middle of the work. We also have tatami mat so that people can meditate. And this is from uh, Delcy Morelos. Uh, she's an artist, Colombian native artist. So she combined the tradition of Tokonameyaki and also the tradition of Andes, which is her culture. And then she used um, earth, uh, clay, and then mix and some cinnamon. And then by turning it back, it's uh, giving. There is a festival to thank the earth, and then she used the Tokoname clay to reproduce that. And this is from Tamura Yuichiro, and then we actually have exhibition here in the novelty industry, meaning that in Tokoname there are export products to foreign countries. And then the title of this work is called Invisible Hand. So within the large, uh, within the huge way of economy, uh, he tried to be, uh, have a story of how Tokoname industry gradually diminished using video. And this is from Harimatsu. Uh, it has a history of 400 years. It's a spotted dye in Arimatsu. And they also had an exhibition, Meet Jal, uh, Jal In. It's a painting. And then people can go in and out. This work is called People's Wall. So response to the environment or the landscape, this is totally different from the exhibition in White Cube. So basically, they also have some uh, consciousness about what's already there, including the tradition and history. So that was a quick, brief introduction, myself, my work. So after this, uh, we have about 40 minutes to have a discussion here. And then all of us, uh, I mean, all of you are artists, and I am the one to show your work. But first, I want to start the topic of tradition. I mean, what is tradition and what is it that we have to preserve or pass on? And then we would like to hear from each one of you. So if we can start from Hoso-san. Thank you for the question. So in my case, I mean, my background is from the Nishijin textile. And this textile has been around for almost 1,200 years. So I think it's very unique about this industry. <coughs> so. I think looking at the history of Nishijin textile maybe gives some hint about what a tradition is because things change and there are many things happen in the history. For example, uh, the political regime change. Once we go to the Meiji period and not many people can afford to buy expensive textiles. But three people were sent to France and then learned about Jagar loom and then they continued on with the tradition. So I think always there was a challenge and then they innovated and so that they can protect or preserve the tradition. So in order to preserve the tradition or to continue with the tradition, I think it's important to make a challenge and try something new. Well, in my case, I'm not really the creator, but I use something that people or artists created. And then we, for example, entertain guests with tea, so if you think about the tradition of tea, you know, our root go back to Senorikyu. So from him, uh, well, it's been almost 500 years. I mean, we've been serving food and tea and then using a lot of artwork. And then everybody enjoy the work, uh, converse. I mean, that's part of the culture of cha no yu, or way of tea. So there is a kind of universe of entertainment, and it's very difficult to define what is the tradition of chanoyu or the tea, uh, way of tea, because I am inside of the itself. For example, if you think about one tool, or maybe tea, I mean, is it really essential to have it as part of the way of tea? But I think what's important is, you know, our predecessors already cultivated the foundation of the culture, and I think we need to face that um, culture as well. But at the same time, we also need to respect and face the history as well. I think that's the only thing that matters. In case of Urasenke, my school, there has been a lot of innovations. For example, if you think about the Japanese art, it always involved the tatami mat. So if you think about the indoor art, 
uh, the tea, way of tea has been growing together with the culture of tatami, but once in Meiji period, there was a lot of interaction with outside of Japan. And then we came up with a new style of way of tea with the table and chair. And Gengen Sai, the 11th Iemoto, proposed that. But now it's already 150 years. You know, some people criticized that when it first came out, but today I think it's one of the standard style of serving tea. So I think 150 years is good enough to call it a tradition, but what, imp what, what, what matters or what's important is, you know, every, I mean, as the time progresses, we need to go through changes, but at the same time, it's a little abstract, but we also have to face uh, what the, our predecessor has been building. Uh, quite an uh, abstract uh, way of saying, sorry about that. One of the big challenges that I uh, recognize as a contemporary artist is that uh, I'm born into a tradition that is trying to get rid of traditions. That, that in a way, as soon as you put the word contemporary in front of your practice, uh, it means that you're trying to disrupt, interrupt, interrogate, critique, uh, tear down. Um, and so it, some might say that this is a good thing, and, it, you know, and there are times when it's good. But I think that for me, the, the traditions that I'm up against are kind of Western white male patriarchy, you know, kind of a certain people being included in, in, in a canon of contemporary art and other people being excluded. Um, craft being excluded from contemporary art and um, uh, uh, ways of working that are de-skilling or uh, lack of knowing so that if you happen to be very good or excellent at a craft, in some ways it may disregard you as a contemporary practitioner. So I think that I'm trying to push the traditions of contemporary art by bringing craft forward and bringing traditions forward and saying that maybe it's okay for a person to be highly skilled, highly trained, in a particular craft that in the past art history might call the minor arts, like textile making or coin making or um, metal smithing or ceramics or, uh, 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 or um, uh, uh, painting with traditional lenses on painting, that I think the future of contemporary art uh, could be a way that highly skilled people are trained to also think about their skill, not only in the conventional ways of understanding the tradition, but also in new and poetic ways, so that they're using, using the traditional knowledge to do new things. And I, I think for the last 20 years, I've been making pots as part of my contemporary practice, and uh, I refuse to make the pots uh, bombastic or expressionistic, I would really kind of stick to like a bizen ware or a tamba yaki or seto yaki, you know. And and if there was any innovation, it maybe it had to do with the um, emotional intention of the vessel more than uh, trying to make the vessel do something else, like a, you know, or pissing on the vessel or breaking the vessel or shitting on the vessel. I, I just made a vessel. And, uh, and I would put that alongside other forms of conceptual work. So I, I think in that way, by including tradition, I'm creating a new contemporary work. So um, the siesta just talked about the modern art. In the world of a modern art, uh, high arts uh, is a key word. We import it uh, from overseas. And then the craft is not uh, categorized within the framework of a uh, fine arts. So traditional crafts in uh, Japan actually was away from the definition of the fine arts. Basically, we imported the way of thinking in the Western society back then. But I would say, starting from 10 years ago or so, the poetry, textiles, or uh, the various uh, expression, the folk arts uh, from the ancient uh, age. Now they are being reintroduced within the framework of the arts. In other words, uh, diversified perspectives have been shared now in the world. So uh, not only the conf 
concept of the fine arts, whatever that was not categorized within the uh, framework of fine arts are not coming in. So potteries, crafts, textiles, maybe uh, this is to do with the uh, location such as Kyoto City. Basically, modern arts definition started to expand uh, compared to before. Now, siasta-san. When you take a look at the Japanese tradition, what kind of value do you think it has? The, the, the first time that I went to Tokoname in uh, 2004, um, many of the potters who I was meeting, they were already in their uh, 80s and 90s. And they, they had a ability from, you know, they had generational ability to make things. And they, whenever I would talk to the old guys, they were always crediting Korea for the kinds of work that they made. And this is a little bit about Minge as well. And so it was, it was interesting to imagine that Japanese ceramic tradition, that, that potters had the ability to articulate and, and acknowledge the importance of other people's practices in order to make who they were whole. So in order to be a great Japanese potter in the, in the tradition, I have to acknowledge the importance of um, the 16th century uh, Korean potters who were brought here under imperial duress, right? Th so that there's this, there's, there's not a kind of purity, even though we're using the word tradition, we're not exactly talking about pure Japanese tradition. And I think that, that when I got there, uh, the, the story I love to tell is that I was taking a class, I was making a tea bowl, and uh, my instructor that day said, you know, why are you, what are you doing? And I said, I'm, uh, I'm making a cha wan. I'm trying to, I'm in Japan, I should be making Japanese pots. So I'm, I'm making a tea bowl. Uh, and he said, well, there are such amazing traditions in Mississippi why are you trying to make a Japanese tea bowl? Why don't you make a Mississippi tea bowl? But there was no tradition of Mississippi tea bowls. There was none, none that I could look at. And he was like, well, what about William Orr? And what about these South Carolinian potters, these black potters who were making jugs? Why don't you make work like them? And, and so in that sense, it, it immediately pivoted my intention from trying to mimic a Japanese tea bowl to trying to absorb excellence, uh, uh, the willingness to work hard to pursue an idea, um, the ability to try to get at the essence or the poetics of a thing through constantly trying to better yourself. That if you're bettering yourself, your pot might be better. If you better your pot, you might be better. So I think that I kind of abandoned trying to make a good Japanese tea bowl and instead, I try to live with the values of being, uh, having an ambition of being a great maker, you know? And that, and that for me, the tradition isn't just um, the button goes here, the sleeve goes here, the scoop lays like this. It has to do with the pursuit of something that gets better as a result of, of your encounter with it. And so I think that, that in that sense, where I would have a concern about uh, appropriation or uh, have more confusion about what it means for me to be in Tokoname, I think what I'm interested in is the values over the aesthetic thing. Well, I think Rachel-san, earlier we talked about the definition of a tradition and especially in the tea ceremony, way of tea, you know, you have some manners that you have to follow. Maybe people have that idea, like there are rules, but you know, in, I mean, it's one thing to preserve the form, but on the other hand, there's another thing to preserve the spirit. So what do you think about that? Right, so when it comes to manners or rules, I, I am from Urasenke school, and actually there are multiple schools in way of tea. So if you belong to one school, the tradition obviously is different as well. So in that sense, manners or rules is like a guideline kind of organized uh, within the same group. So it's just one guide or guideline and they've been organized throughout the time. I mean, of course, by using that as a reference, 
me you can uh, you can choose the way that's um, least uh, that has the least waste but of course people have different physique some people are large some people are small built and if there's a rule to put something here but for it may be difficult for people with the long reach or short reach but do we force manners or rules actually it shouldn't be that way I believe so in that sense so learning from the reference is important, but what's especially when it comes to tea uh, tools and utensils, you know, they have been they've been used in a space where the guest and host s spend time together, and eventually they came to the conclusion that maybe this is the appropriate size, or maybe if this is the size, then we should put it here. I mean, there's they have. Uh, been through a lot of practices and then came to that shape or that size. <clears throat> and I, I think tradition should be the backbone of people's day-to-day -day life, but today, actually, they are kind of separated. And in order to fill the gap, I mean, there are many people today and our predecessors trying to fill the gap. But I think like people like me who are really inside of that tradition, uh, I think we need to be more active to make proposals, especially when it comes to manners, form, formality. You know, some people think it's like a textbook and you have to follow everything, but you know, we have to practice and show actually that's not absolute. And today I'm working a lot with the contemporary artists and through that experience and I have a lot of experience with connecting the tradition and the contemporary art, and I feel that I need to be engaged more in that type of activities. I hope I answered your question. So as Taro Okamoto said, that the tradition has to be rooted in a day-to-day -day life. If the tradition is not rooted in a day-to-day -day life, then we shouldn't call it a tradition, or we, I think that's one of the good questions that he asked. And people, especially in the traditional art like ours, really need to think about that. Sugimoto Hiroshi, a contemporary artist, compared the Marcel Duchamp to Sen Norikyu. So the values uh, back then, and there is a totally different value um, that they um, provided and then I think that's connecting to the spirit of contemporary art. Well, I, well, I can understand that very well because Sen no Rikyu, I mean, people often compare pre and post Sen no Rikyu, but when you look at what he uh, created, there are many counterculture aspects. For example, the artwork come from China, and back then people think it was a good thing to put those China in the Tokonoma, but he suddenly go out and grab a wildflower and put it there. So that was a, one of the counterculture ex example. And today, uh, we are trying to pursue what he tried to pursue, and then we've been practicing tea. Today, the flower vase that he used is now more valued higher, uh, in a sense, than the traditional China from China, but I think because of the history or the tradition, sometimes the value um, kind of reversed or go up. But the tea uh, utensils and tea tools, are we really looking at them as he did? Or maybe if you think about the creativity, I think Riku found, uh, found it interesting to be creative. So not so much about the flower vase itself, I mean, of course, he was very selective when it comes to the aesthetics, but so if you think about, you know, because he was such a very powerful and influential person, but if we, I mean, when it comes to today, how do we overcome, I mean, how do we go over that? I mean, we shouldn't be too afraid to do that. So for uh, you talk about something that people think that there's no value, but I think you need to add value to it. And I think that's very basic, foundational to what Fiesta is trying to do. But before we talk about that, I, re I want to talk a little bit about technique in Nishijin textile. 
you know, enormous amount of techniques need to be passed on uh, across generations. So when it comes to how to do that, and you know, what can be changed, I, I know you're working on a lot of innovations, but what to preserve or what you can change? I mean, how do you, what do you think about that? Well, that's actually a question that I often ask, because the longer the history is, it seems like the tradition has a very strong uh, influence of the power to it. So I'm always trying to think not to preserve too much, but rather I want to make a breakthrough, but I'm still brought, I mean, I'm, I'm always brought back to tradition. So I'm trying to think about how I can make a good contrast with the tradition. And uh, Izumi-san just talked about the Sen no Rikyu, but also in kimono, I mean, we have uh, formal uh, kimono culture. You know, there is a history behind that, for example. Uh, there was a lot of samurai lord or daimyo in Osaka, and Yamashina Tokiro, Yamashina family, uh, he basically he was a stylist to the imperial family. And then all the samurai lord asked him, and which color should we wear? He answered black. So before that, you know, like Hideyoshi, for example, wearing very colorful kimono, but because this Yamanashi family said the black is formal, so everybody follows suit. And then they started to think that black is the symbol of power. So during the yes time, they start to wear black for formal kimono, and they started to put the family symbol on the back. So there is always somebody who made a change and then changed the tradition. So in that sense, I could be that person too. For example, uh, when I talked to him earlier, if Sen no Rikyu is here today, we wonder what he's going to change or something new that he's going to do. And I think it's important to bring in that type of perspective into tradition as well. So what about the successors? I mean, how do you develop um, people because you have to pass on high level of techniques. So when it comes to techniques and skills, and I want to talk a little bit about, so there has been many innovations in in textile, and one of the major milestones was about 150 years ago when capital moved from Kyoto to Tokyo. Before that, it was a manual labor. People go up like four meter high, and on the loom, people, I mean, person, need to put the thread down, and maybe if you can show with the slide, oh. So the person standing on the top have to pull the thread up, and then when the thread is being up, and then the, the, the vertical uh, thread comes in, and this is how they weaved. So they need coordination between the person on top and the bottom, and then it took so long to make just a single meter so it took so long and it was so expensive, but still there were someone who can afford it. But in now, now that they were in Meiji period, they couldn't find people who can afford that luxury. And then some of them went to France and find out about Jagat loom. I mean, in France, they also had a similar thing in royal uh, a monarchy and they couldn't find that good way. But in 1801, uh, one genius, Yosef Marie Jacquard, and then he invented a Jacquard loom, basically using a punch card. There are holes on the, uh, the uh, sheet of paper, and then you can put the thread inside that. So it was first programmable loom in a sense. So it took hundreds of people, but now it was automated because of this loom. So fabric that was only available to the king or queen was basically democratized. So this is what I was trying to explain. Uh, Stora kibibata, the person on top and bottom, and they have to coordinate to weave. How can you show the next uh, slide? And then the punch cards. And this is a uh, uh, John Murray Jacquard. And so these are the punch cards. And in the hole you see, that's where the warp, the vertical thread goes through. So there's an innovation. There's another innovation, by the way, which I would like to show next. This is computer, IBM computer, believe it or not, and punch card is there. So uh, whether the uh, warp goes in, um, up, actually, um, it goes uh, to the zero one, uh, the world of the computer. 
So why computer program and mathematicians are we are working with? Because uh, programming, state-of-art technology is being incorporated into the world of textile industry. So we talk about the uh, warp and web. Um, so uh, we have these uh, uh, principles. So uh, we have a warp and weft goes and back and forth. So uh, if we are not to use it, and what will happen? Chaos. In other words, uh, through the programming uh, uh, calculation, uh, the chaos is going to be eliminated, and you can have a fine textile product. So technology um, and uh, uh, the work art of work are quite uh, closely uh, connected and uh, technology can help us do our work as well. Quite interesting. So we have uh, some uh, broadcasted uh, NHK uh, TV program touching up on Ieyasu, um, historical story. And so uh, now I have a different view now. Now you talked about uh, how this uh, formal, uh, the wear, uh, have been explored uh, with just one single color like block. Yeah, I, I want to actually respond to this because it, it's, it's actually, it's so exciting uh, to hear Hoso san talk about um, the technologies of kimono and then when I'm like out on the streets in Kyoto just seeing a 15 year old or a 22 year old or kids on a date rocking great kimono or rocking their grandmother's kimono, right? And the, the idea that maybe technologies or fashion, they are reoccurring in, in our cities and that, that these things that we're calling tradition, I feel like we, we as humans already have the ability to like freak, freak the tradition. So even if it's their grandmother's obi, maybe they convert the obi into something else or they split the obi in half because they don't want a full obi, they want a half obi or a quarter obi. So I, I think one part of what I'm interested in is the ways in which um, the moment when the technology no longer needs 100 people and it only needs one person, the challenge is that our memory starts to fade. Right, so that you know, when I go to you know, you go to the temples. There are fewer people who know how to cut stone than there used to be, and as a result, we don't have this the we don't have the pervasiveness of new temples because there's fewer stone carvers and stone builders. Um, when a temple has a flood or if there's a, a natural disaster. The anxiety that we have as a nation, not only in Japan, but all over the world, that we'll never be able to build that thing again because something was lost. I think that I'm trying to make an argument not for uh, technology, not to have technology. We, we, technology is great. But I think that we also need schools that preserve the kind of ongoing tradition so, so that the more, so that people can then have a choice to be involved in the traditions, right? To, that, that one would um, happily decide to say, you know what, uh, I live in Mino, I love Mino Washi, I wanna continue making paper. Um, in the case of my dad, he did not want me to become a roofer. But he had no sense that I would be able to take the materials and the technology that he, the discipline that he gave me, and convert that into painting and drawing. And so in a way, if I didn't have the, the history of the tradition of it, I could never get to an innovation. So it's like, I need my dad. And my dad, for him, it was just like dirty, stinky work. And he sent me to college to do something clean and get a job, like get a good job. And that, that artists don't make money, so why would you ever try to do this, you know? And so when he saw that, I was creating innovation inside of roofing. He laughed at first. He's like, no one's gonna want a roof. Who's gonna want a roof? Who's gonna want tar, the smelly material in their house? And I think that in some ways now, because I uh, know a little bit about roofing, when I talk to other roofers, 
When I talk to potters about clay, when I, when I go to Arimatsu, I feel like uh, I have the heart of a craftsman so I can ask uh, you know, different questions like, uh, this is so beautiful, isn't it? But like, you know, this very nice invisible hem and trying to be very careful with like, oh, even though you have a kind of silk, Sexy, so, uh, the, but but using this double, arigato, using this double structure to create the weight and the depth, so that it it then creates this kind of elegant difference, this elegant difference between the single layer and the double, and it's like you know those moments where you 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 hope that people don't give up knowing how to sew. You don't throw it all out. But if you're able to like learn the traditions, then you can freak the garment in a different way. And I, I, I think that's what I'm interested in, is like uh, no longer feeling as if tradition in and of itself is bad, but additional philosophy and poetry at a, another class is needed alongside that says uh, within the traditions, we can do great things, you know. I, I, I wish I knew how to use uh, the stone tools that my dad had, you know. But I look at his, those, that set of tools, like with the roofing equipment, I know what to do. With his uh, stone equipment, with his plumbing equipment, it just looks like a bunch of uh, big cords and uh, hoses and, uh, you know, I would never know how to turn the motor on, you know? And, and when, I, when I go to small towns, I see past technologies that no one knows how to use anymore. And, 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 and this, this for me is like the dilemma. And, and again, I'm not talking on behalf of Japan. I'm talking about when I'm at home and I go to a hardware store and I'm like, what was that used for? I have no idea. And so finding ways to keep those things alive, I feel is very, very important. Hardware store, uh, you are at uh, work. Basically, it's a, um, as is, as was. I mean, you just uh, put the walls around and then just uh, place uh, all that you have on a glass case. So now in terms of a preservation, museum can be the place where uh, the human activities are preserved. Maybe some refurbishment are taking place, uh, but... Uh, the tradition through the objects, they will be uh, transmitted into the next uh, generation. So uh, Ise uh, Shrines uh, Festival is really nice because every 20 years they have to uh, rebuild it. They destruct and rebuild. This shrine goes this, you know, on and on and on for the centuries. And then by so doing, they can transcend transmit the technology to the younger generation. So now, if you are to do the museums, um, you re actually demolish and refurbish and rebuild. It's a new way of uh, value uh, when it comes to the museum. Uh, that's a very interesting point, because if you think about building or space, you know, some work that they have the exact the space or the building as a work. And in Chanoyu, one of the interesting thing that I find out is if you, the whole space is kind of carved out. For example, back in the day of the Riku time, I mean, we have the record of the tea ceremonies. So in the four and a half tatami squares, what kind of tools were used, who were invited, what kind of tea ceremony was held, it's already recorded. And actually, uh, what they did back then is similar to what we do today. In building, you know, they have to go through renovation and repairs, but we still have them. So as a person, a single person, I go into the space, I feel like I can really feel that space that they felt back then, even though I go in there for the first time, knowing that somebody was there and doing something similar. So chashitsu, the tea room, is the way uh, is the space that reminds you of a lot of experiences. I know that that space has accumulation of experiences, and that's where we have the artwork, tools. So in a way, the host of the tea ceremony or tea party is similar to a curator in a sense, selecting tools and selecting utensils. But that's where, um, you know, and then that kind of accumulates over time, 
historically and then so the space itself uh, I, I feel that we also need to preserve the space or the feel of space and these days some of the tea tools and utensils are, are preserved in museum and their exhibit but when they are used I think they are best they are at their best so you, preserving is important but at the same time using them or put, putting them to use is also important and I think we need to think about that more so that we can pass the interesting part of tradition to the next generation. So in that sense, you know, tea tools and tea utensils in museum, hopefully, you know, they can make them available so that we can use them sometimes. Yes, so I, I it's a very, uh, it's very exciting to be here with you both, you know, because um, for a long time, like I said, I was making, I was making objects and then I was giving them a new context so let's say I was taught to make a Japanese tea bowl but at home we didn't drink Japanese tea you know but we use bowls to eat collard greens and black eyed peas and soul food and shit so I converted the Japanese tea ceremonial bowl to a soul food bowl you know and we would and that 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 a bowl that was maybe ripe for soba or ramen, which meant that it was wet with stuff in it. Instead of using chopsticks, I was using my fingers. And so there, were, there was a kind of, um, the form was a form that could hold many people's foods. That, and, and that some forms hold wet things better and then some things, if I have a big hand, I need more space in my bowl to get my hand in it if I'm mushing up my collard greens and my cornbread. So I would make a wider, heavier bowl because I have a wider, heavier hand. And the, in, the, in, the innovations, if you will, weren't just innovations, um, decorative innovations. They were, they were ways of accepting that there was cultural difference and that I was trying to adopt the technical skill that I was learning and then apply it to this, this environment that I was in every day, right? So, but then I did carry some things like, you know, Shintoism. In Shintoism, there would be these moments where uh, I would see a piece of wood and I would be ready to throw it away and my sensei would say, no, don't throw that wood away. It's like, well, the, the wood is old and broken and brittle and fragile and mossy and dirty. Uh, there's nothing in it, I would think. Well, my sensei would say, you know, don't throw it away. <laughs> you know, don't. <laughs> TG son, please don't, just don't throw it away. And it took me, you know, getting from 25, 29, getting a little bit older to understand the life that was in things. And I came to understand the life that was in things because it was in part related to the way that we understood the spiritual power within things. I'm curious about what happens when we move very far from the, uh, the spiritual origins of these traditions or the philosophical origins of these traditions and all we have left is the form, right? So, so lots of people study yoga now. You know, this is my yoga pose. Lots of people, there you go, keep it straight. Lots of people study yoga and, and, and they're getting one part of the mindfulness and uh, their bodies are changing and they're, they're looking good, but maybe there's also something that's still not helping us make good decisions about how to be kind to each other in the fucking world. You know what I mean? And so, I, so I'm very curious about your thoughts on the history of tradition and which parts 
are necessary to keep. And, I, and I'm thinking particularly about how kimono was related to like a cultural tradition of being fly and sexy. And tea was a way of rejecting ostentatiousness and rejecting, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, aristocratic arrogance in trying to offer something more humble. If you guys could talk a little bit about, you know, bringing some of those values with you. Well, we only have three minutes, so maybe each of them has 90 seconds each. Okay, I try to be brief. So, you know, uh, weaving or textile itself already have a history of 9,000 years. You know, we've been around together with the humans has been around. But the basic of uh, weaving is the cross section of the horizontal and vertical lines. And this basic has been preserved over 9,000 years. And what's important is the power balance between the horizontal and vertical threads. And I think textile is basically a tapestry of a history of humankind throughout different times, reflecting the passion and creativity of the people. In case of Nishijin text, uh, a textile, we have 1,200 history. Actually, in weaving, the horizontal line has a lot of freedom, but the vertical has a very fixed line. And I think this shows the relationship between us human as history. We can believe in the vertical line, that's not gonna change, but and then we can be creative on the horizontal line. That's what I think. Thank you, very good summary, I think. Well, that's very difficult to answer. Tradition, what to preserve, or what do we need to keep? In case of Chanoyu, there are so many uh, related elements, including architecture, kimono. If you try to change one thing, by changing one thing, it will have a ripple effect on other things because you also have to think about the total balance. So some people call chanoyu as a comprehensive art. But given that, I think, I think the most important thing is the fact that you have a host, you have a guest or guests, and they share some values in the same space through communication between the host and the guests, that situation is the one that we need to keep. In the old time when Riku started the tea ceremony and then we used to use, I mean, some people may feel that the tradition there, but by having some traditional tools, maybe it might make people nervous and they can't really appreciate it. So tools is basically a vessel of a soul, so or reflect the soul. So I think what's important is the spirit and how can we capture or understand the spirit is the most critical part. So again, <laughs> the question of the tradition in the tea ceremony, when it comes to what can be changed and cannot be changed, it's uh, too difficult and too complicated for me. But up to now, from a traditional stance on tea ceremony, I've been thinking about cha, uh, tea or tea ceremony, but with the Sabi A activities, I have a lot of collaboration with the contemporary artists and they, actually have a different perspective about Chanoyu, and then that's what we are getting from the Sabie activities as well, and kind of giving us a hint about what to preserve and what to change. So what I find value in and other people find value in may not be consistent or the same, so for Chanoyu, because it's so complex and complicated, it's very difficult to answer in one word. But on the other hand, I really want to invite everyone to be engaged so that we can think about this together. <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, when it comes to contemporary art, we have artwork, but what are the meaning behind it? And in the spirit of uh, artist, how we are going to interpret all of these things, and that really matters in the world of contemporary art. Whatever that you mentioned, um, we're all connected, and uh, I would like to 
uh, just uh, make a one last PR. Starting from April 24th, 2024, Asian first uh, exhibition is going to be held uh, in my museum. So uh, it's been helped by many people, uh, especially the people in Kyoto City. So all the culture uh, which is embedded uh, in the siaster and then how that can be f in a fusion with the Japanese uh, tradition and then think you'll be enjoyed able to enjoy it. And thank you very much for this session.